everybody. Um, I think Thanksgiving is taking a, a hard hit because Christmas starts, I think, shortly after July 4th. There's a brief interlude for Halloween because it makes people, the businesses, a lot of money. And then they just rush right into Christmas. And I think Thanksgiving, you know, so much like us thanking God is, is like, almost like, oh, okay, then we'll, we'll deal with it when we deal with it. But you know what? Otherwise, I'm not going to really dwell on it. And I think Thanksgiving absolutely just shakes us and says, you know what? You have so much to be thankful for. You know, you're, you're like for me, um, I'm, you know, alive. I'm standing up. I'm somewhat lucid. Um, you know, my wife tells me that there's things I can do, not all that great, but I can still do them. And then, you know, if you want to know you're blessed, those of us that we're thankful, look at your kids and then look at their kids and just say, holy mackerel, you know what, Lord, I never would have thought that, you know, I would have kids and I never really imagined it was so hard to imagine that I would have grandkids. And then some of us, you know, some people here today even have great grandkids. And, and, you know, it just gets better. Those titles, you know, grandpap, great grandpap, you know, those are just like the best. And if we aren't thankful for that, if your heart doesn't melt whenever you see those kids and you realize that it's a blessing from God, I don't know what is going to shake you up then because that is like, that is, is great. It's one of the best feelings, one of the best reasons to say, thank you, Lord. Amen. You're not getting older. You're getting better. How many have heard that expression? Yeah, it's like, you know, almost like, uh, you know, kind of almost like pacifying. Oh, you know, don't worry, you didn't do that exactly right. You're not getting older, you're getting better. And somehow, though, when you receive an accolade like that, you don't feel like you're getting better. You're kind of feeling like, okay, well, you know what? You tried, but because of your age, we're going to pacify you. Well, we'll talk a little bit about that here. The barber, my barber, says, hey, Paul, man, that bald spot on the back of your head's getting bigger. And I like, you know, I kind of look up and Wow, you know, you really got a lot more gray hair than I remember. When I cut your hair, the gray really shows. And my wife is my barber. <laughs> you know, it's like, what are you trying to tell me, dear, you know? Well, I just had a birthday this past Tuesday. I turned 69, and I am just have been blessed so much. My wife turned 65 on December 4th, and I'll, I make sure that I remember that. This year especially, you know, because that bald spot isn't getting any smaller, dear. I referee basketball games, and I'm standing there before the game started, and you kind of stand, you know, and watch the, the kids as they're warming up. And somebody yelled out, hey, ref, you don't like to listen because it's usually bad. But they yell, hey, hey, ref. And you turn around and they go, are you allowed to wear a hat when you ref? And I said, no, hats aren't allowed. Well, then do you have sunglasses? Because the glare from your bald spot is blinding us. Oh, I said, that, yeah, that's, that's a good one, you know. And the game hadn't even started yet. I haven't even made a call, you know. And they're already starting on me, you know. But... You know, I always like the, 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 what people say. They'll say something like along the lines of, Wow, you can do that at your age? That's always an oldie but a goodie. So whatever you want to call those of us that are blessed beyond 
beyond belief, actually. There are a lot of names that we put uh, with this. We call, um, uh, we call pensioners, we call people retirees, we call them seniors, we call them golden agers, we call them old fogies, and we call us old farts. So whatever of those you would like to pick, whatever one you feel uh, describes you, uh, we are called antiquated, we are called ancient, and we are called antique. You like the alliteration there. You know, like that's what old people do. We find words to start with the same letter. Well, it helps us remember them. Well, I think what we want to do as, you know, it talks about God wants us to evangelize before we fossilize. And in order to do that, you have to get out. Mark talked this morning in Acts where, you know, the, the, uh, the apostles, they had their deacons and everything, and, every, and, and you know, the, the Jerusalem was okay, and Jerusalem came under persecution, and the apostles then eventually went out. Because, and that, that persecution really began God's work, because it began to spread, you know, throughout the, the gospel, throughout Judea and Samaria, and then wherever they went was the ends of the earth. But evangelize before you fossilize. You can talk about that as a person, and you can talk about that as a church. You know, there are a lot of churches that are just, you know, uh, that I see, they, they are just hard churches. They're beginning to fossilize. They come in, they, they listen, you know, in the morning. They might have Sunday school if everybody shows up. They don't have really an active kids choir because there's not a lot of kids, so they just don't want to bother. They listen to the pastor. They put their money in the plate. They sing some songs, and maybe then, uh, you know, they go home. The last one out close the door and turn out the lights. Uh, they're beginning to fossilize, I think. Do they evangelize? I always look at what a church does in the way of evangelism. Do, what do you do other than Sunday morning? Sunday morning is already booked, uh, you know, it's already carved out. So you want to go, you say, okay, yeah, I go to church. Great. You go to your church on Sunday morning. What does that church do? Do you have, you know, Monday night, is there anything going on? Tuesdays, you know, do you have a, a, a praise and pie? Do you have, you know, meetings? Do you have Bible study? You know, what do you have? After the church service is over, you have the hanging of the greens. What do you have other than the Sunday morning service time? That's what determines if a church is evangelizing or fossilizing. And, you, you know, you, you need to think, this, you know, uh, from what I see, the things that are going on from the number of people that are on the Sunday school list and the youth program directors and, and different things, you know, there's a lot of evangelism going on. And, and you're directing it to the most important uh, I guess you'd call it, well, the politicians say demographic, but you're directing it to the most important people that need to hear it, the youth. They are the ones coming up. Because if you remember from the book of Judges, it says when that generation finally died away and went to their fathers, a new generation came up. They did not know the Lord. They did not know his uh, wonderful acts. They did not know that he brought them up out of Egypt and made them a nation. They did whatever they wanted and everything that they did was right. They simply were not taught to respect and love the Lord. You're not doing that here. You are teaching the kids to love and respect God. And as far as evangelism goes, that is like the highest. That is a wonderful thing that Abundant Life Church is doing right now. And it's, it uh, is so evident with how many people's names were called today. Evangelize before you fossilize. Somebody said that, you have to aspire to inspire before you expire. And in order for that to, hap for, in order for that to happen, it, you have to aspire. You have to have the want to. You have to have God putting something in you that says, you know what, I need to do this. 
And then you inspire someone. God inspires you to go aspire. And what that does is it inspires somebody. And if it inspires kids, inspires someone in your family, inspires your neighbor, somebody at work, you know, anywhere, anywhere you go, if you can inspire someone before you expire, then you've done God's work. A lot of older people in the Bible here we're going to look at uh, in, in just a moment. Uh, they ask a, an older gentleman, they say, every day you come out and you sit on this bench here. Why do you do? He says, I am so fortunate to sit in the shade of this tree that I planted a long, long time ago. He had the foresight to say, you know what, eventually I'm going to get old and I'm going to want to be want to sit down and I'm going to need some shade. So he planted a tree. Eventually that tree got really big. And as the gentleman got older, he was able to walk out and sit on the bench under the shade of the tree that he was inspired to plant. So, you know, planting trees, planting ideas into children, they're, they're going to grow. And when they grow, what are they going to do? Are they going to provide shade? Are they going to provide help to people? When these children get older and they, they move on and they begin their life, what are they going to do? And, and the best way to, that we can prepare them is to raise them up with God's Word. You know, in our house, when we were growing up every day, uh, we had to do something. And on Sunday, you went to church. You know, now ki kids, parents, they look for reasons to not go to church. I, I find that so distressing. Well, you know, we got in late Saturday. So? So you got in late Saturday. You still have to get up and go to church. We, we as kids, when I was a child, we did that. When we were parents, me and my wife, Robin, we did that. Our kids, we went to church. Nowadays, I, I think it's kind of like, ah, you know, it's an option. It wasn't an option when we were growing up. It, is, it's, it was like, you know, uh, the, the favorite thing my wife heard, they'd stay out a little bit later on Saturday. They went to a dance or maybe there was a, a football game or something and they got in late. Uh, you know, 7 o'clock, her dad was rolling around, rattling the beds. You, you know, if you're going to dance, eventually you got to pay the fiddler, he would say to them. So here, you danced last night? Now, let's go. Get up and get dressed. You're going to pay the fiddler here. And they would go to church. Didn't matter if there was a foot of snow or whatever, they went to church. Some biblical support for those of us who are big children. Proverbs 16.31, it says, Gray hair is a crown of glory. You can look it up in there. When you need a little help, turn to Proverbs 16, verse 31. Psalm 71, verse 9. Do not cast me off in the time of my old age. When I get older, don't just put me out. You know, treat me with respect. How many cultures in the world, whenever someone gets a little older, they are revered. You know, they, they, they really mourn the fact that they, that they are passing away. And it's becoming more and more like, you know, older people as they get more and more old. They're not, they're like almost not wanting to be dealt with. And that's just a shame. The, the, the kids, the sons, the daughters and all, they need to take care of these people. They need to take care. I tell my grandkids and my kids all the time, someday you are going to be taking care of me. So, and, you know, so believe me, if you do something wrong, I'm going to come back. I'm going to haunt you. You know, you'll know that I'm mad. So you've got to treat me with, with respect here when I get old. I may not remember it. But, you know, at least you'll be able to treat me with some respect. And finally, of course, those of us that can remember a song from the Beatles, Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Well, I just turned 69. I could sing the same thing. Methuselah. 
His name, uh, Methuselah, meant man of the javelin in the Bible. He was six, uh, 969 years old. Genesis chapter 5 lists a lot of older people. Adam, 930 years. Seth, 912. Enosh, 905. Canaan, 910. Jared, 962. Noah, 950. But then all of those, at the end of each one of those, it would say, Adam lived to the age of 930 years, but then he died. All of those had that, you know, unless God comes back and he takes us home by way of the rapture, which I am so hoping is today after lunch, we're going to die. We are going to pass away. You know, man is destined to die once. So if, if that's going to be, you know, Paul Soloski lived to be 69 years old and then he died. Well, then you die. You know it's coming. You know, someone mentioned, you know, you're laying there and you think, oh my gosh, I'm in bad shape. But and there's so many things that I didn't do as I was laying here, um, you know. But if, if, if it's God's plan for your life that you were, are to die, that's God's plan for your life. I don't mean that in a mean way. It means that God feels you're done here or you cannot be cured on this side of heaven and he's going to take you home where you can be cured and there'll never be another thing wrong with you ever. For right now, we are older, many of us, you, every day. You know, time marches on, however you want to say it. But our, our scripture this morning, Abram, Genesis chapter 12. Abram is told by God that he was going to give him seven blessings, he told him. You know, and, and he reads them all out to him. You know, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm, I'm going to bless you. Uh, all, everyone will be blessed by you. And this is the one that the United States really better pay attention to. We have been blessed here because, uh, you know, not because we have a special covenant with, with God. God has a covenant with one nation on this earth, and that's Israel. We have been blessed because we have blessed Israel. God says, I will bless those nations that bless you, and I'm going to curse those nations that curse you. So, you know, we need to keep continuing. And sometimes I wonder of our commitment to Israel, but we need to bless Israel. God blessed Israel. God blessed Abram. He, he blessed him with, with Sarah. Sarah was, uh, lived to be 127 years old. In Genesis chapter 23, you'll read, uh, Abraham lived to be 175 years old in Genesis 25. So they lived to be older, not Methuselah old, but 175 years and 127 years. Abram was blessed. Um, he had Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, three of the main pillars of the Old Testament, three of the, the pillars of of, of, of the Bible, and Abraham was so blessed to be able to be father to them. He went from, from uh, Ur to Haran to Damascus to Shechem to Egypt to Bethel to Hebron. You know, Abram was an older person, but he traveled well. He didn't have a Winnebago or anything, you know, where he could move around, but he traveled well. Abram and Sarah were older people, uh, it, it said in the scripture that was read this morning that Abram was 75 years old when God called him. He says, you're going to move up from the land where you are to a place where I will show you. Okay, all right, everybody. God inspired us. Now we're going to gather all the things that we have. Yeah, don't forget that over there. I like that. Yeah, we're going to in, in gather up everything we have, and we're going to head out of Ur and head to where God tells us that we're going to go. Yeah, I don't know where we're going. He didn't tell me. He said, gather up all our stuff, and let's go. God said it. I believe it. Has that changed now? God says something. 
talks to us either through a dream, through a song, through a, a sermon, through the way Scripture is read, or the way you see something in your Bible that maybe you didn't see before. God still speaks to us. And when God speaks to us, just remember like Abram. God said, hey, I'm going to take you somewhere. And Abram says, okay, we're ready to go. And he took him. Gave birth to Ishmael. You know, Abram, you think, you know, God, God called this guy, you know, and, and my gosh, you know, he should be, God picked him for a reason. He's like wonderful and, and beautiful and, and everything and, and so obedient. Well, Abram was not. Abram had some flaws. And one of them was giving birth in Genesis 16. He gave, uh, Sarah gave birth to, to Ishmael, or I'm sorry, Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. Um, he was 86 years old when that happened. A Abram was. But then the blessing is coming through Isaac. Uh, he, uh, Sarah gave birth to Isaac, and Abram was 100 years old. Sarah was probably 90 or thereabouts. Sarah was the first woman in history to qualify for Social Security and WIC benefits. You know, if you hear about all those that are going on today, think of Sarah. She was the first one to get those. Ishmael, who was born, um, was the leader and ruler of 12 Arab tribes. Isaac was ruler and leader of the Israel tribes. The Old Testament is filled with people who are older. Moses. Moses' life is divided into three 40-year terms. He lived in Egypt until he was 40, and then he left Egypt, and he was a shepherd, and he lived out of, of the land. He was 40, and then he turned 80. When he turned 80, God says, you're going back down to uh, Egypt, and you're going to bring my people out. Then when he was 120 years old, then Moses died. You know, we can only hope that we accomplish these things when God calls us that we can do them. Are you going to be asked to go down somewhere and lead a, a, a whole group of people out of somewhere and take them to a land that God's going to show you? No. But maybe you're going to look out after the service and you're going to see somebody standing there because they don't have a ride and it's raining and they're either waiting for the rain to stop and, or they just don't know what they're going to do. You know, picking that person and saying, hey, you need a ride home? That's picking somebody up and taking them to a place where they need to be. And, and it's not as dramatic. It's not going to make the Bible, but God notices that. God wants us to go and do. He wants us to evangelize. He wants us to love other people and show love. And as I told you before, love is a verb. We have to show love. We can say it, but we have to show it. And helping people out, donating to them, giving them food, giving them a ride, asking them to come if you want maybe to your house. They have nowhere else to go. They can come to your house for a, you know, a Thanksgiving dinner. You know, it seems like no matter how many people are there, you always have plenty. Always have some to share. So if some extra person comes that, that gets invited because they're alone, you know, I mean, just for us personally, there's a young man that we've known like since we would live down on another place of town before we got flooded out there. We knew this boy lived right across the street. His mom, his dad passed, or not passed away, his dad left the, the, the family, and his mom just recently passed away. And he showed up at our door one day, and he come in, and he just says, I am so lost. I just am so lost. So we brought him in and sat down, and we visited with him, and we talked. He accepted Christ that night at our house when he, we didn't even know he was coming. And somehow he, my, my son said, yeah, they're home. I think they're home. And he found our house and he come in. He may come to Thanksgiving dinner with us. And if he does, I am just going to say, hallelujah, Lord, thank you. He's, he's home. He's found a place. Maybe there's somebody like that in your life. Somebody that is like just, if they, maybe they won't say it, but maybe you can just look at them and think, wow, they just look lost. They need something. Well, maybe you can help that. 
You know, it doesn't matter if you're older. You know, it doesn't matter how, how aged or, or how young or, or, or what. You, you, we just need to help people. I think older people do a lot more things because they've been around so long they just don't care. You know what? Over there, look at that. Everybody's kind of wondering who that person is. It's like they're new. And somebody, you know, that's a little bit older, been around, they walk up and they'll say, hey, you look like you're new. Hi, my name's Paul. Who are you? You know, that's the kind of things that churches do. Make people that come in feel welcome. Make them feel like you want them to be here. That's how churches evangelize. 86% of people say that they come to a church and they find a church and they stay there. 86% because somebody invited them, waited for them at the door, walked them in, showed them where the bathroom was, where the kids have to go for Sunday school, and then went in and sat down with them through the service. Maybe called them the next day and said, hey, you know what? I was just thinking, thank you for coming. It was so nice to see you. Then rejoice when that person comes back next week. That's evangelism. Churches need to do that. 86% come because someone invited them. Yeah, and, and I don't want to pass it up, but something like 4% come because of the preacher. 4%. You know, I deserve at least 5%. Come on. He said, we got a dynamic preacher. Oh, yeah, is that right? Old Testament. What about New Testament? How about Simeon? He uh, was happy when he saw, because God promised him, you will not pass away until you see the Messiah. And he was on duty that day in the temple. When Mary and Joseph came in, he went over and he held baby Jesus. And he says, okay, Lord, you can take me home now because you have allowed me to live long enough to see the Messiah. You know, he was well old, well on in years. And then right after that, how about Anna? Her husband died, and for 80 years or so, she uh, lived in the temple. Really, you know, back then, especially a woman, uh, when the husband dies, they really don't have a lot of options. A lot of times, you know, the son maybe will take them in and invite them in to, to, to his home. Otherwise, m many just go and live in the temple and be like a, a, you know, a, a temple-serving person. They prepare meals, they serve, they do things in the temple. And, and that was her life. And, you know, Anna was probably over 100 years whenever she saw Jesus. Anna, at that time when she saw baby Jesus, even though she was well into triple digit in ages, was never more alive. Why is that? Because she saw Jesus actually physically saw the Lord. We don't have that. We don't have that ability right now. We don't see God. We, we, we hear, perhaps, we get a vision, we read his scripture, somebody comes up and just inspires us. Anna and Simeon, when they were older, saw Jesus. They saw God, and they were both happy. God allowed them to live long enough to, to see the Apostle John. He was the youngest apostle, and yet he was the only one that didn't get martyred. He was exiled. He, he probably lived the entire first century. You know, uh, after he was, maybe, he was maybe 17, 18 when Jesus called him. Young John, the apostle that Jesus loved, he uh, went to the island of Patmos, and here it was supposed to be an internment, an exile, but God didn't leave him there. God pulled him up and allowed him to see, uh, as one writer put, he, he stood on the edge between heaven and earth, and God opened the door, allowing him to see heaven. And, and God and John wrote, you know, a number of books, 
maybe the, the, the best one perhaps is the last book, the book of Revelation. And he just said, this is a, a, a snapshot into what's up there. And there were so many things that John saw. He was an older person. He'd seen things. He'd been through stuff. But yet he wrote in his in, in the book of Revelation, he wrote, I, wrote, I saw something that was like a man. I saw a light that was like the sun. He couldn't even bring himself to, to, to describe what they were because they were just so different than what a human being could see. So if you read Revelation, you'll see many times. And then I saw something that was like something. John allowed a brief glimpse of heaven. And he told us about it. If you read the book of Revelation, it was a re revelation from God to an old man and was written down. And we still have it 2,000 years later. So I guess you could say it's an old book, but it's still out there. The entire first century, John lived, he wrote five books of the New Testament. John was called the Apostle of Love. He used love quite a bit. Uh, he used the word love more than all the synoptic gospels, the first three gospels of the New Testament. He used the word love more than all of those use the word love combined. John was the Apostle of Love. Love is a verb. So I'm going to leave you here with, I don't know, I don't like to leave people with challenges, or I don't like to leave you with, I want you to go out and do this, because there's enough to do out there. When we leave church, there's plenty of things that we do. You know, life really takes over once we head out the door. The mission field starts at the end of that parking lot right out there. But I would like you to just think two things. Number one, thankfulness. Thankfulness can never be overdone, overused. And we're coming into a time now when thankfulness is in the forefront. And number two, love. Show love, say love, but, but make sure you act love. You know, love is a verb, and we need to go use it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. So what if we're old? You know, we're fine. Uh, we're, we're just, before we go, before we leave here, before we pass away, we want to make sure that our job is done here on this side of heaven. So encourage us, help us, you know, just allow us to do your will. We've been around a long time, Lord. Eventually, we got to catch on. So, you know, why not now? Why not today? Amen.